Hey everyone, if you're watching this, you probably submitted a photo to Storm Photos of the Year. And if you are watching it and you didn't, then you missed it and you're here because you heard about the contest from a friend or a video got shared uh, or, or something like that. If you're not, jump on our website, stormphotocontest.com and sign up so you'll be notified for next year. Uh, last week, we tried to get together all four of us judges to do our top selections critique video uh, that we want to get out by the 17th. And unfortunately, with scheduling conflicts and traveling, Linda could not be there for that. And we really value Linda's input, of course, as all the judges. We didn't want to do uh, this video without her, especially without her actually having seen all the images and even scoring them. So we're going to hope, um, hopefully do that here coming up really quick. But while we were sitting there, me and Mike and uh, Nick, we thought, hey, let's Let's just do something fun, we're here. So we picked five images that almost made the top 30 of photos of the year, and um, but didn't quite. And there were various reasons why, editing, composition, technical things. So we discussed that here. And part of our job as judges is to nitpick like this, where we wanna pick the, the top 30, and then the top 10, and then the three winners in each category. And that takes a lot of little critiquing, nitpicking, um, going over these things with a fine tooth comb and that's part of it. But we're also hoping that this critique would be educational, especially to help everyone going out this year wanting to take better images, what you can do uh, to get better at it. So hopefully you'll enjoy that. We really appreciate the uh, photographers that um, unknowingly lent us images to uh, do this uh, critique. We appreciate you all submitting and I know one of the photographers already saw this video and was real excited that that we were talking about his and and he's taken all this um, critique and he's going to get better this year so we're glad it worked for him hopefully everyone else will enjoy this and so without further ado let's jump right into our critique conversation so there is so many awesome photos and a lot of awesome photos that didn't quite make the cut and we wanted to kind of talk about like why some of these that are still amazing didn't quite make the cut that some of the other photos did. So we have uh, we have five photos here um, kind of set aside to talk about. Uh, why don't we take a look at this first one? The iconic Devil's Tower, which I've never seen in person. So this is like postcard material. Like It's a great composition. I, th I think that it's a great composition because you have the, the road kind of leading back towards the Devil's Tower and then the rainbow framing it all. It's, it's a beautiful shot. Um, th this person also submitted another photo that I believe did make the cut. Correct. I think that the, for me, like the only thing that kind of holds this photo back is just uh, some of the processing. I feel like it, a little bit more could have been milked out. You know, that sky has so much uh, interest and, and color in that file that isn't really brought out because it, it needs just that little bit more contrast i guess right and I'm, I'm right there with you i mean the composition is unbelievable to be able to go to devil's tower and to get you know anything really cool there i mean there are good storms that go by there but to be able to grab a lightning bolt or a rainbow like this or something is you know one of those i mean not once in a lifetime kind of photos but one that you're probably only going to get once in a while and and so the composition and what's going on here is wonderful but I definitely agree that it's, I think it's actually kind of under-processed, which yeah. seems like it's, you know, you don't want to say that too much because some people way overdo it. And so you don't want to be like, hey, process it more because you don't want to go too far. But this one um, is definitely the light on the Devil's Tower itself is kind of like that and the rainbow and the road to me are like the three things that I really like about it. And the light on the Devil's Tower is just, uh, it's not emphasized enough for me. A, a little more contrast and even some, you know, color that maybe would come out from the contrast um, would really like draw my eye there even more. Yeah, I, I agree with you guys on that. I think the composition's awesome. You have a really nice leading line up to Devil's Tower. Got like this beautiful spotlight of color and light on the Devil's Tower. The rainbow is just, you know the icing on the cake and i think what you mentioned earlier nick about working the sky a little bit more bringing out a little bit more contrast and um a little bit more color contrast too you got some really great warm tones and cool tones to separate in the sky 
Um, I'd like to see a little bit more depth created too. You have that leading line, which pulls you through the image, but the grass and all the vegetation around it's kind of muted. And I think with right. a little bit of dodging and burning, possibly you can kind of work the audience's eye through, you know, light to dark tones through the image as well. So um, really love the shot. And uh, yeah. I think there's just a little bit more post work that could be done um, to kind of bring this image to life a little bit more. Yeah, I think it's kind of a common theme that we've we've seen with a lot of entries is that a lot of the contrast has been added globally, meaning just to the whole photo. And when you have kind of a high dynamic range scene like this, where you have, you know, a foreground that is not being hit with any light, and then you have some of those really bright clouds off in the distance, you can only add so much contrast before you're either blocking up shadows or blowing out highlights. So in an image like this, if you can treat the sky separate from that foreground, you know, either dual processing it in Photoshop or using luminosity mass to add that contrast, it's going to really help you know, treat that sky separately so you can darken down, recover some highlights, add some vibrance and, and contrast to that sky without blocking up the shadows in the foreground. I totally agree with what you said about uh, adding a little bit of depth as well. When I see those kind of yellow tufts of grass yeah, there, I'm just thinking, oh, that would dodge so nice. Yeah. You could add a little bit of uh, depth there, but it's a beautiful shot. It just needs that little extra something. And that kind of to, like, even like the color, like dodging and burning on, on the, um, like on the grass, that's something that um, I like to do, but sometimes, you know, you get in a hurry and you're just kind of editing a photo maybe. And you're like, well, this one isn't the greatest picture in the world. So I'm not going to take the time, but those kind of um, details can, in, you know, really enhance a photo, especially adding a little more like detail and contrast in the foreground, even that road. And then, yeah, going over each little tuft of grass and painting in just a little dodging in just a little color um, to make them pop and stand out just a little more, especially that works if you have even, you know, flowers and, and other cool things mm -hmm. like that to really make your foreground because it's a pretty foreground, like all that grass and stuff is just wonderful. Yeah. I think uh, there's two things to touch on real quick that I want to add to this image is uh, first off, I was fortunate enough to be standing right next to this photographer for the scene. Um, and so I know that they did something that a lot of photographers don't do or necessarily think about with rainbows. And they use the polar, uh, circular polarizing filter to really enhance that rainbow. And if you're not familiar with using a circular polarizing filter for rainbows, uh, essentially you can turn that filter and increase the polarization, which cre increases the saturation and kind of the vibrance within your rainbow. And eventually you'll get to a point where you turn it a little too much and all of a sudden your rainbow disappears. And you know, kind of back it off a little bit and that's the maximum polarization you're gonna get, maximum color you're gonna get. So they used a, a circular polarizer here to really bring out every little bit of color they could for that rainbow. So um, that was an awesome thing. And then one thing though that I think we've all talked about is this might be an example of having a great frame, a great subject, but those small attention to details will go a very long way to take this photo to the next level. When you have an image that is special, like this one, it deserves like extended attention, you know? It's, a, it's not something that happens every day, so why not spend a little bit of time on it? And it might not win this particular competition, but it's still an amazing photo that you can go back and reprocess and, and keep tweaking because it's definitely a portfolio piece. Speaking of um, the little details that are important, kind of leads up into this image, I think, um, because at first glance, you know, this is, you know, as storm chasers, we know that when we're out there um, trying to find something to put in a foreground of uh, supercell like this one this was i believe the ulysses i think may 21st last year that very many chasers were on um you have a boring field here that you know to me i do kind of like boring and stark but when you have a tractor just sitting there um you're trying to struggle for these kind of you know compositions and so the there's a couple of things probably this video that you guys want to talk about but the first thing i know is like hey this looks like a really nice panoramic but I could see on the horizon here on the right, there looked like a little bump. And when I zoom in, you can kind of see the pano didn't stitch right there. And this frame of the panoramic is either out of focus or 
you were the photographer was moving a little too fast when they were panning around i'm sure it was done freehand um, which is how i do most of mine i don't ever use a tripod but it's it's the that little thing can mess up an image where you are a little bit uh in a hurry because doing something like this you're standing there you're trying to kind of pan around and shoot from right to left and you actually need to freeze at each spot to take it and some of us and i've done it where i'm taking a picture i'm just going so fast i don't actually stop and and so this person unfortunately just messed up this frame a little bit where you can totally see the line and it's a little bit um out of focus and that's kind of like that attention to detail that can bring an image up from you know being okay to like perfect yeah it's really easy to do when you're in the heat of the moment you have those giant storm cell yeah. you know crashing in on you it's really easy to get in a rush and to not like take your time and do the little technical things properly uh, either that was you know so it could be something as simple as the the photographer was using autofocus and it's, yep. you know, kind of dark. And if your autofocus point is not on something that is easy to focus on, it might miss focus in one of those situations. So one of the things that I do, and I know you guys probably do as well, is sure. when I'm in these shooting situations, I like to use back button focus. That way, when yep. I'm shooting a panorama, uh, <clears throat> when I'm shooting a panorama, I can get focused. And then for all of my frames, I'm not going to refocus. That way, it's never going to miss focus in those frames. Right. And it's always going to be focused in the exact same spot. Um, also, we were kind of joking about this earlier, but uh, storm photographers are kind of addicted to contrast, I think, because it makes, you know, the the storm, the sky structures look so cool. It makes those cloud structures look more dramatic. But one of the downsides to all of that contrast that's often getting added to these frames is or it's going to be like over on the left side of the frame here where we have those blown highlights. So you either need to, uh, you know, mellow out on the on the contrast that you're adding, or better yet, add that contrast locally. That way, you're only adding it to the part of the storm cell that is benefiting from it, and you're not blowing out those highlights. But if that you blew out it, if these highlights were blown out like in the raw file, that means that what ideally this person should have done is started on the left side of the frame. Right. And ex make sure that in your exposure, you're exposing for those highlights. You're not blowing those out and then pan across to the darker side. So if you start off on the side with the brightest highlights, you make sure that, you know, your histogram looks good. You're not blowing out those highlights and then shoot across to the, the right. You know that you've yep. got it as as opposed to starting on the dark side, going all the way over to the left. And then on the very last frame, you realize, oh, crap, I just blew out my highlights. Got to do it again. So it's a pretty common mistake that people make when they're shooting those handheld panoramas. A really good point there, Nick, is, uh, and I, I think we're all guilty of it at some point, you know, we start on the wrong side. You know, you're, for me, you know, I always, or most of the time now, I'm starting on the side that has the brightest um, area. So, you, right. you know, you're, you're exposing for that area, then you work your way over to um, the darker area of your your frame and for me it's a little bit easier to in my opinion to pull up the shadows and the blacks than to recover those highlights now sometimes with storm photography you get in these weird situations where the sun's really low on the horizon and, and it's just blaring through the rain curtain and you're going to get these hot spots so a little trick that you can work on um, for your images is if you absolutely there's no way to recover those highlights or to expose in the field for that you can go in with a luminosity mask and select that area sample a color very close to it and kind of lightly paint in or dodge in that color to kind of cover up that um that blown out uh highlight over there so for this frame here i would suggest maybe going in there with like the lightest of yellows that you can sample from around there and just very lightly like a 10 percent, 20 percent opacity just kind of painting that in there and now we'll take that bright white um to like a more yellow so it just kind of matches the tones and the colors that <laughs> i've I never had to do that <laughs> <laughs> that's because michael binsky is perfect <laughs> yeah the other thing i wanted to point out is you know we've already touched on the the stitching of the panel but small attention to details um i always tell my workshop students pay attention to the corners um and in this frame 
it's so small, but like in the bottom right corner, you've got this kind of bright green bush that it's just a very easy either stamp or just a small scooch over on your crop to get that out. Um, I'm not a fan of having something really dark or really bright that seems kind of out of place in, the, in a yep. corner. And to me, that caught my eye and that may be just being nitpicky, but um, I would crop that yep. in just yep. a little bit from the right. Yeah. And I also just like finally, like, I don't know how much information was at the top and if the uh, panoramic, you know, kind of cut off the top. But for me, I think that I would love to have just a little bit less of the foreground and more the sky, like to just shift it up about, I don't know, an eighth of the image of the frame, yeah. just up a little bit where the tractor is a little bit lower in the frame. And I see a little bit more of that supercell because I think we're missing um, kind of this top fringe of clouds uh, that would probably be a little more interesting than kind of like you said that bush on the right and um, some of the some of this cornfield that's been harvested. Yeah, comp is um, it's not it's still not bad, but it could it could be um, kind of panned up just a smidge. Composition is always hard in panoramas because you can't you can't yeah. see exactly the frame that you're right. taking. You don't see what your composition is until after you stitch it. Um, so so it's better it's better to get more information when you do these do almost two rows you know do a lower row like from left to right especially you know as we're talking about expose for the highlights start on the left go to the right and then go up and then go back to the left and get you know get 24 photos of it you know so that you have all that information to work with yeah shoot far wider than what you think you're going to use because you can always crop in but you can never like recover the stuff <laughs> that you didn't shoot and when you're shooting a panorama the point is already to include more so you might as well include more than you think you need that way you can crop out um, anything that you don't need yeah nick you nailed it on that one that's what i was going to mention next and then the other thing too is i think mike with you talking about shooting a little bit more up um compositionally speaking um that's gonna also uh, give you a little bit more sense of scale um with mm. this tractor in the field there so um it's it's not dead center but it's centered enough to where in a way you kind of lose a sense of scale going up more and giving more of that vertical um feel to the storm and then you have this smaller tractor that's going to give you a little bit more scale and yep. kind of have a little bit more impact in this image might be. I, and i also even wonder if, if the photographer had crouched down and put that tractor kind of up against it a little more how that would have looked yeah just kind of wondering one little trick too that I, I do, and I also kind of encourage others to do when you, um, you know, I do quite a bit of work, my uh, work in Lightroom first and then take it over to Photoshop. Before I export that image uh, into Photoshop, I'll go in at the very end and just take the contrast slider all the way to 100%. Yeah, and yeah. that's a good way to kind of help reveal any sensor spots that you may have missed. Yep, um, yep. As you work contrast and as you work, you know, even saturation at times, you can pull out some of those dust spots that are usually very subtle. But now as you process the image, they become more and more apparent. So before you take your image from Lightroom to Photoshop, just take that contrast slider, make a note yep. where it's at so you don't have to you know, mess up your image. But if you're at like plus 20 on contrast, pop it all the way to plus 100, look through your image, see if any sensor spots have come out. They're typically in your air, in like in highlights and whites and brighter areas are more visible. Um, but just take a quick look because that yeah. is something that can separate your image from being absolutely fantastic to just, you know, a good image. You know, it, it, it's, it's small details like that that can really set your image apart. Totally agree. Yeah. yeah, and it's and it's and then the guy who took this though, this is just a really, I really like the overall photo and the storm and the object in the foreground. Like I just, I think it's cool. It just suffers from a couple of those things. So, even though we did talk about it for a long time, it's still like it's beautiful. And it was, you know, one of the ones I was like, man, this is great. And and then you kind of zoom in and, and you have to nitpick because that's part of what we do as judges, is we see great images and you have to figure out what um sets this one apart from others and a lot of times it's just nitpicking little things like that all right so we'll we'll uh head over to this one um which is just a spectacular lightning strike wow. i mean i don't know what i can't see from the metadata what this was shot with but it looks probably like a uh at least a 24 to mm -hmm. 16 millimeter kind of i want to first just kind of like slow clap 
and then get faster yeah. <laughs> because like to 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 have the guts to stand in this location oh yeah when the lightning when, is striking below your location not above but below you I mean, I mean, I'm hoping this person is in their car and their tripod is the one that is in the most danger, but still. <laughs> I, I tip my hat to you, good sir or ma'am, for uh, having the cojones to go out there. And uh, that's that's not a good feeling to have lightning striking around no. you and down. No. But no. what a photo. And, and also look how just how awesome the ground. Yeah. I mean, this is still like blue hour, obviously, but just how much is lighting up the ground where it hits that's just fantastic that's one of my favorite things about lightning photos where you can actually see where the lightning is striking it's just the the it's, pool of light that happens around that strike is so cool well that's what's been so frustrating about this contest and and jealousy inducing is that is my favorite thing i strive so much to try to see where lightning bolts land and all the like photos that we've got in where we've seen where the bolt lands mm -hmm. has been like oh my god it's just so great so seeing this one come through i'm like look at that like not only you see where it lands but they're like above it looking down on it it's right there i, I mean a mile or two away possibly it's all in frame i mean in such a huge bolt there's so much of it missing i'm sure <laughs> so as the as the post-processing snob I'm going. I'm going to be the bad guy here and point out, <laughs> start pointing out the things that I don't like about the image. The image itself, the you know, the moment is incredible. The you know, the, the what we're seeing is incredible. But when you have an image that is this special, it's worth taking the time to really process right. And for me, like the haloing that is happening around the you know the edge of the rock formations, we have. You know that very obvious haloing that's happening around that edge it's just it's really unfortunate and a lot of times that's a combination of either painting in you know a local adjustment with like an adjustment brush or something and not getting it all the way to that rock formation we even have a dark halo on this one part of the of that rock shelf it definitely looks like you know there was kind of a darkening effect that was painted in with an adjustment brush or maybe it was a layer in photoshop and it's just, it's just one of those things that can kind of kill an image. You know, the po the post processing is so important, and the the haloing that is happening there really kills it for me. Also, I don't know what's, I don't know how I feel about the white balance. I feel like there's a little bit, yeah. I don't know. There, there's a kind of an interesting yeah. white balance thing going on where we have lots of cyans down low, but we kind of have lots of purples up above. Mostly it's the it's the haloing that's happening from either the adjustment brush or painting in a, an adjustment layer in Photoshop. I was going to say it's kind of interesting that because the right side of the image from about, you know, almost the image almost split. The right side is pretty fantastic. Like it's not over edited. There's not a lot of haloing or anything going on over there in the white balance and stuff looks good to me. It's the left side that suddenly... It almost looks like slightly a different image. It's not, but that side has kind of all the, all the I guess, flaws with the editing. And it also just feels, that, and maybe it's because of that haloing, but it does feel, the white balance feels a bit off because it feels a little bit blue to me. Yeah. And I don't know if they were trying to tone down the warmth or something, but I feel like the left side, I probably would have tried to warm it up a little bit and then kind of brush that in to to blend it a little better because it does feel just a sl a smidge too blue to me even though I know what time of day it is and it can it it's almost like I'm looking at that going okay I've seen that sky before I know that it can look like that but but there's still something that it seems off from the right side of the image to the left Yeah my my biggest critiques for this image is obviously the moment's amazing um it, you know the processing needs a little bit of work uh, as nick you mentioned the haloing around uh those cliffs down there in the bottom left corner um that's that's pretty that needs to be toned down a little bit but i think uh mike if you don't mind zooming in on the left side bottom left corner please i think i don't know i just feel like maybe and i don't know if it's from clarity or just i feel like the image might be a little bit over sharpened um so i don't know if that's clarity or texture or just sharpening in general um yeah. so that kind of gets me a little bit and i don't know if that actually 
works up into the branches of the lightning because sometimes when you over sharpen you can start seeing kind of artifacting around the branches um so i don't yeah. know if that worked in there yeah but i can't see that either the lightning actually looks pretty decent and crisp and sharp i mean that's what's also nice about this is it does seem like it's pretty in focus because the lightning looks pretty good back sharp and then, so back to the left corner then um so just the, the haloing but to me that the corners are so important in, in a frame and so having if you zoom out now you having that kind of void of the gravel in the bottom left frame mm -hmm. that's yeah. a little bit distracting because you have all this dark area and green and then you have a bright patch of like yellow and 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 kind of like white or gray tones yep. um so how would you have fixed that? Um, obviously, well, it's 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 harder it's hard to say. Hey, you know, I would have moved three feet forward and put that out of my frame because I don't know the condition you were shooting in, or you know, if you that's as close as you could park your car to this spot. But you know, maybe uh, a smaller, a little bit tighter crop could have negated that whole area down there, or more of it. Um, you could always uh, possibly you know warp the image a little bit by pulling it out just out of frame a little bit just to you basically want to minimize that because once my eye sees that you have this fantastic lightning bolt once you see that void there it's kind of hard to not see it um, well and i can just imagine that this you know if putting myself in this position that this photographer let's just say that they knew to point their camera there because another bolt had already struck that they probably either either this was I don't think it was taken inside their car because I don't I can't imagine that would have been that clear of a shot from like inside your windshield yeah. or whatever. But so they would have had to have jumped out of the car. And if I'm in that position, I am not going to be out there for longer than like 10, 15 seconds. And so being able to pick a foreground like because, of course, I would have liked to walk up to the edge of those bushes and shoot down over the top of them so I don't see them at all. Um, but this person I'm assuming probably did as best as they possibly could because you had nowhere else you could, um, you had to jump out, set up your camera and jump back in the car before you got struck by lightning. I think the I think the, the moral of the story is you never know when you're gonna get some amazing <laughs> photo and it's always right. worth, you know, putting in that just a little bit extra time to like, you know, just check your composition before you, risk your life and and try to get that yeah. camera in a position where you don't have to make these tough choices after the fact because there's only yep. so much that you can do at this stage but if had you yep. just moved just a little bit closer to that edge and eliminated that bright corner um it would be yep. a much more solid uh composition freaking ridiculous i dream of getting bolts like that yeah <laughs> so that it, my heart aches looking at that. I want. I want to. I, I want to go storm chasing right now. So, right. Um, all right. So here's just um, this Minnesota tornado. We have at least three different people have submitted photos of this tornado and multiple photos of wow. it. So um, it's it, one of, it was probably the tornado. I mean, I think it was the tornado of the year for sure. At least based on the images <laughs> and with clear sky and no rain. I mean, like, I mean, just it's just un, it's just unfortunate that none of us were there it's incredible <laughs> i think so we we looked at this when we were talking uh, talking through all the photos and which ones we might want to um illustrate but this is another case of like perspective like where you choose to take your photos from even even when you have a tornado b bearing down on tornado you. of a lifetime in front of you right like yeah. th this is a you know a once in a lifetime photo and wouldn't it be nice if the bottom of that tornado wasn't obscured by those trees I, I do like the fact that those trees are getting a little bit of direct light on them and has that nice contrast between the dark clouds and the and the bright ground but i definitely I just feel robbed of not being able to see the bottom of that of that twister. Um, so, so I mean, that's the obvious thing. I think compositionally, like framing wise, it's it's nice and symmetrical. I could do with a little less foreground, perhaps, and a little bit more sky. But I just I just want to see the bottom of that twister. You know? Yeah, I think that this. Um, I mean, it's literally the only thing that I would have to say about this image yeah. is that you know. And um, not to get too into a, too long a story, but I was on a tornado in 2016 where I had a great composition, but I wanted to time lapse it. And I literally had to give up a great spot that I was shooting this thing because it wasn't, it had 
a road and power lines and houses down the road. It wasn't the composition that I wanted and I had to bail on it and look for something better knowing this tornado might lift at any moment and I am going to miss my shot. And, and again, and that is what sometimes it takes. Like I know this person got all kinds of other photos of this tornado. So it's not like, this was it and that's all they got that day and so we're kind of nitpicking this one photo that was a shot of a lifetime i know this person got more so there is so this is just one but again uh, this is what they submitted you know as one of the photos of, of the year and and so you know for me that this would have been one that yeah i might have stopped and taken this real quick while i was driving or something but I would have been driving as fast as I could to somehow get a clearer view of the bottom of that because you want to see, and we've seen it in other photos, the bottom of that tornado and what it's doing. Yeah, and it's, it's hard to say, you know, I would have done this, I would have done that. You don't know the situation, right. the roads, no. you know. Like you mentioned, you have no idea. Like this tornado went on to be a very long lived tornado. Um, right. But at this moment, you're thinking, oh man, this thing could lift any second, and this is the only shot I'm going to get. So, yeah, it's snag this shot, but then I would say, don't spend a long time here. <laughs> get the shot just to document it, move on, and try to find a cleaner shot. Um, and, and the other thing, you know, we, we've obviously talked about the foreground. The other thing, too, um, a little bit of localized contrast uh, in that debris cloud there um, could have really made, kind of almost brought a little bit of like three dimensionality to. The tornado there so um okay. obviously you know a little bit different perspective would have been great seeing that like to me like the holy grail of tornado shots is that ground contact like seeing the full yeah. condensation all the way down debris field below it uh or debris cloud below it um so get this shot move on to a better spot and also a little bit of contrast could have helped bring out a yeah. little bit more to that and, and we've all taken these photos where you just grab a photo because you want the memory. Yeah, just in know, case this it. is the only chance you get, you got to at least take the photo, right? Right, right. But 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 I think the thing is, I know this person had other photos, and I think uh, uh, one or two of the other ones may have made it to the top 30 instead of this one, even though to me this is probably the coolest the tornado looked, like the widest, the big like cone shape and the light on it and all this stuff is probably the coolest it looked, maybe. I mean, I don't know. Some of the other photos, it looked cool for a while in, a, in many different places. But um, I think another photo might have made it further if I, you know, because we would have seen the, the ground yeah. contact. And all that I think if, if I were in this spot, in this exact position, the only thing I, I would have suggested doing differently if you had to stop right here, run 20 feet to the left uh, to the left yeah, you, yeah. you could yeah, have yeah. gotten the more of the tornado kind of in that void between the trees there um or even the one to the left of the main tree um yeah, yeah. just to give a little bit more i mean it's like the tornado is literally in like the highest area of like vegetation so like you know running 10 yeah, 20 yeah. feet to the left you know would have given you a little bit better perspective on uh, the uh, mm -hmm. entire tornado there on the on the processing front like i i feel like this is very tastefully processed and i yeah. mean so anything we say about the processing is is more down to taste but when i look at this yeah. i definitely see all of that dimension that i could potentially bring out with a little dodging and burning particularly on the right you know top corner of this frame if you were to kind of burn down some of those darker shadows in the in that structure you could really um, not only restrict the eye from going out that top right corner by darkening it down, but also bring out a lot more texture and dimension, which obviously is what this photo is all about. It's all about that structure. So like the, the post-processing part of me, like I'm already, I feel like I want yeah. to go in and start <laughs> doing it as I look at this. Yeah. I would have upped, you know, I would have done like a layer of just like, you know, good contrast or even a little bit of clarity and then inverted it and then brushed it in like a little bit around the swirling parts of the tornado and the dust cloud and stuff to make it pop. But at the same time, I still like how tastefully yeah, done it is. It doesn't, tasteful. it doesn't bother me at all. I don't, I'm not sitting here going, Oh, that they should have done this. I've just thinking like, I probably would have pushed it a little more knowing me, but at the same time, I really do like the colors and the balance of it. It's actually yeah. uh, pretty well done. Agreed. Um, all right. So here's our last one. Um, Mike knows this spot very well and the person who shot it <laughs> once again. Yeah, I, um, I, I mean, if you want me to chime in real quick on this one, just because sure. I was standing like right next to the photographer again. Um, 
The, this is just, you know, you guys, when you guys go out there and shoot, you can do everything right, and then nature's just like, here, hold my beer, I'm gonna screw everything up. Um, mm -hmm. And I think this was one of those instances, you know, the photographer got a great shot, beautiful supercell, uh, really nice foreground. Um, I think everything was tack sharp on this image and composed real nicely. It's just an instance of, you almost had it. Um, and, you know, he, the photographer did everything he could do. He was shooting at 12 millimeters, you know, you're, you're getting the entire storm, but the bolt just happened to strike right outside the frame. And as cool of a bolt as it is, like that ground contact with the lightning bolt is key. And yep. it leaves yeah. you, I mean, it, it's just- Leaves you wanting more. Yeah, it leaves you wanting more and you want to see exactly where that struck. So um, it is kind of painful to see because I know the photographer and I know like the scene and everything. And it, it was just literally, there's nothing that they could have done differently to make this image happen. It wasn't human error by any means. It's just the roll of the dice on this one. Well, and I know that the person with you is still kind of learning about storm chasing. And for those of us that might have been there, we may have done the same exact exact thing. Although I know like from where we were, the storm is moving a little bit to the right. And um, it's the situation that we might have also known to kind of slowly pan over as it's moving because that middle, you know, kind of updraft at the top of that bell or whatever shape it's off a little bit of the right of this frame. And I think I would have been trying to keep it um, centered a little bit. But the thing is, is this could have been, if that bolt would have instead gone to the left and struck in front of that, right in the middle of the, the lines of the field, it would have been an unbelievable shot, like just incredible. So these are the shots that I sit there. Like I would probably like, I would probably have, wouldn't post this photo because I would be so mad that every time I looked at it, that that bolt went off by, I mean, like an inch on the frame. I mean, it's just, it's just so, I just like ache for, for this guy because, um, and, and, and also, you know, me and Mike, we do this all the time and Nick does, you know, does it too. I would, we are such perfectionists because we do this all the time where for, for anyone else that doesn't do it enough that this is, you know, this storm is one of the greatest, you know, structured storms that I've seen in person. And to actually have this lightning bolt with it for, you know, for people that don't get to do this as much as a shot of a lifetime. So, you know, for us that are, you know, perfectionists and looking for the absolute best, we would just be sitting there going, I cannot believe that bolt didn't land in frame. You send it to retouchup.com and say, can you drag that bolt over in frame, please? Yeah, I know a guy <laughs> in India that can make that happen for you. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's just so, it's one of those things that happens every time you go there. Well, this storm doesn't happen every time I go out, but there's plenty of times where I think that I have a good composition set up and the lightning happens either in an awkward part of the frame or just outside part of the frame. Yep. And it's just how it goes. That's why we sit there and take as many photos as we do is because just because you have a good composition set up doesn't mean that the action's gonna happen in that composition, unfortunately. So the photographer did everything they could do. They were there at the right moment. It just happened just outside of frame and it happens. And Mike got them on a great spot. I mean, I know we shot the storm from just maybe a little bit uh, north of this spot and we had a horrible foreground because we just had to stop. And I love the foreground, I love the color of all of this. I do think now that I was looking at it closely that um, there are some dust spots. There's one there and I think that might be one and maybe one up here. So one of those other like attention to detail kind of things that might have um, got missed. Um, but uh, but man, it just, just overall like the editing of it, the color, um, it's all perfect except for that. Just pan to the right a smidge. One thing too that I want to like long distance high five on this is um, it's very hard to not completely blow out lightning shots when they're going yes. through the clouds. Um, and although, you know, it's a little bit hotter in the highlights where that lightning bolt goes through, that's just how it is. Um, that's how it is. But not having it completely washed out to where you're starting to see banding and stuff like that um, is mm -hmm. a good thing. Good job on the photographer to control the highlights, whether that was in post or just exposure wise out in the field. Yeah. yeah. I think my, I have the same bolt and I know you do too. And I think mine was probably a smidge more blown out than even he got. So 
um, kudos for sure. I mean, all of it is great. And the fact that he was shooting wider than you, from what you told me, <laughs> he was at 12 and you're at 24. He was actually looking pretty smart uh, being that wide um, because that it is the wider you are on these storms, especially when they come close, you you almost want to be that wide because again, you don't know where the bolt's going to go. And, and of course he's so wide and it still went off frame. It just is gut wrenching. You know, another little critique thing that is, you know, it's not just this photo, but it's kind of a common theme throughout a lot of these photos. A lot of times when we're doing these, these kind of shots, we're shooting at slightly elevated ISOs and, or we're shooting in a high dynamic range scene where we're trying to recover a lot of shadow information. So, and it's really easy for the noise to kind of get away from us. Like when we're lifting shadows and, and adding a bunch of contrast and, and a lot of these photos have a lot of sharpness added as well. You really have to kind of at the, at the end of the edit, take a look at some of those areas that you've you lifted those shadows and make sure that you're not adding a lot of noise. And if you have try to go in and locally just do a little bit of noise reduction. Um, one of the things that I've noticed, and not so much in this photo, but in a lot of uh, other photos we've been taking a look at, is that the, the sharpness has just kind of been globally added. And there's a lot of areas of a sky that does not need extra sharpness because all you're actually sharpening is noise. And if you've already got kind of a noise issue, you're just making that noise issue worse. So um, one of the things that has really stood out to me looking at all of these images is the fact that too many of the adjustments are being added globally to the whole to the whole image. Try to really think in terms of of locally adding adjustments only to the areas that actually benefit from that adjustment. So you're not, you know, compromising other parts of the image because it makes this part of the image look better. If that makes sense. And if you're not familiar with localized adjustments, um, that doesn't mean you have to jump into something as advanced as luminosity masking in Photoshop. Uh, Lightroom's got some great tools, the radial filter, the grad filter, even the uh, adjustment brush, you can go in there and do localized adjustments in a more controlled manner than just, you know, the global sliders. Yeah. And luminosity masking is a pretty difficult concept to get at the start. So even not even doing that, even just learning simple, you know, make a layer that's really contrasty, invert it with a mask and then just paint it in in a couple of places, kind of like, you know, what you're doing in Lightroom with the with the radio brushes and, and all that kind of stuff. But not having to go full fledged luminosity mask, but but kind of getting your feet wet with masking in Photoshop. Can, um, that can really, really help. Awesome. So hopefully some of you guys found this useful. These are images that are incredible, but they didn't quite make the make the cut of the, the final 30 images. So the next time you hear from us, we're going to be going over the ones that did make the cut, but we thought that this would be interesting and useful. Hopefully you found some tips in here that can help you guys the next time you guys are out shooting or post-processing the images that you've shot. So hopefully, you liked the video. We'll see you in the next one. Take it easy, everybody.